Man, it is a classic late spring, early summer day here in the book cliffs of Utah. Not a cloud in the sky. It's April, but it feels like May or June. I mean, just perfect weather. I'm walking out to these outcrops behind me, the first ledge of sand, because I have not been here for several years. And I'm actually leading a field trip for a university and a couple of oil company geologists in just a couple of days. Um, I've got my notes, I got my old photographs, but it's been a while since I've set foot on these outcrops. It's always a good idea to double check things because, you know, your interpretation has changed. Hopefully your interpretation has changed since the last time you looked at something. We're always learning, we're always taking in new information. If you're looking at the same rocks over and over and you're not changing your mind or your opinion or your interpretation of them, you're not learning anything. You probably shouldn't be teaching others how to think or how to learn. Um, that's my philosophy anyway. I know some people disagree. That's just me. So I'm gonna go look at that first layer of sand. That's what me and my group always called the Hatch Mesa outcrops. Other people have different names for them. Behind that, you can see the classic um, shale slope of the Mancos Shale. On top of that are the sandstone tongues of the Mesa Verde group. Um, or the Black Hawk, however you want to lump those things together. But it's things like the Kenilworth, the Aberdeen, you know, the grassy, sunny, sunny side, and all those. We're not looking at those today. I'm here to look at those Hatch Mesa outcrops. They're controversial, like a lot of things in geology, like a lot of sedimentology uh, and stratigraphic things. There's a lot of controversy about them. Differences in interpretation of how they were deposited, differences in interpretation of what they are. I've got my thoughts, other people have their thoughts. We're gonna take a look at them. Let me know what you think. I'm always open to new interpretations. Comment, tell me I'm totally nuts. Hey, I'm used to it. I've done this for years. I'm usually wrong about stuff anyway. We're gonna take a look nevertheless and see what we see. Come on along. You can see they're really pinching out to the east. Um, that's real, that's not just artificial. They're thinning, thinning, thinning. And behind me, they're kind of thickening Looks like you're adding, um, maybe? Ah, uh, maybe not. They're definitely thickening though. And then off onto that hill, there's a little bit better exposure because there's not the talus that we have. So I'm gonna start on one end. We're gonna kind of work our way down, see what we can do about getting to that um, open area that doesn't have all the talus on it. Uh, and just take a look at the facies, grain size, trace fossils, sedimentary structures, you know, the usual stuff. First stop on that easternmost edge of this outcrop man it's just chock full of ripples and horizontal bedding so we've got horizontal planar lamination we got ripple lamination more horizontal more ripple more horizontal so you know that's kind of interesting we've got traction currents and they're all going eastward makes sense the shorelines here in the campanian are to the west Everything's kind of blowing roughly eastward with the deltas and the shorelines prograding into the east. So whatever system this is, it's, I should have mentioned, very fine grain sand. Um, iron stained, obviously, but it's very fine, rippled, planar laminated. Not super high energy, but definitely not just sitting in quiet water type energy. I should mention too, I also found um, on an isolated slab, um, a burrow. A vertical burrow, simple vertical burrow, might be siphonicness, uh, bivalve trace. There's not a lot for sure. I mean, these things are not super common out here, um, but there's one, and there's some other little planolites type things, very simple horizontal and, and inclined burrows on some of these surfaces. All right, so we're gonna keep walking around and see what else we see. We've got planar lamination, ripples, very fine sand, few traces. Let's see what else we got. All right, just walked, I don't know, like 20 feet. And here's a very interesting slab behind me, um, under me. You can see remnants of ripple lamination on the top, but there's also a fair amount of burrowing and bioturbation. And in fact, there's a fair amount of chondrites down here. So chondrites is on the surface of the sand, but it's made by um, polychaete worms in the modern lagoons and bays. Um, of coastlines have been found to make things that look a lot like chondrites. But a lot of fossil chondrites show up in environments offshore, uh, quiet water, oxygen poor. 
Uh, the ones found in modern lagoon systems are shallow, but also oxygen poor and pretty stressed. Whether it's the same type of organism or the same family, nobody really knows. Point being, chondrites here is on the surface of the sand. They were not burrowing into the sand, they were coming from above and kind of bottoming out onto the surface. So it's suggestive that there's low oxygen content in the background material uh, in the shales, the Mancos shale. So offshore, kind of low oxygen, deeper water, and periodically we have these laminated rippled sands come blowing in from west to east. When that stops, when the sand stops moving, the chondrites organisms get back to work as the muds and, and uh, fine gray material lands and settles out in the oxygen poor environment, the chondrites burrow into that and when they hit the sand, they kind of bottom out. So they're mining uh, for nutrients. So that's telling us something about the background environment. And it's also giving us a clue about how the sand was introduced to this environment. All right, not bad. Okay, we've moved maybe about 150 feet, maybe 200 feet from the last outcrop. We've moved westward, um, so in the direction indicated by those ripples as being landward. So we're moving from off in the ocean basin towards the coastline. And would you look at this? Sure enough, the sand bodies are thicker here. Um, in between them, there's some wavy sand and silt. Um, the sand is not that just purely rippled and laminated. Um, there's some low angle lamination here, but it's not got the same amount of fine grain material creating those really discrete ripples and laminate like we saw at the first stop. So this is pretty remarkable in the space of just 150 feet, you know, 50 meters, if you're of that inclination. Um, it's changed remarkably. It's gone from really flaggy, flaky, rippled laminated to a little bit thicker stuff. Um, you know, that's a good 10 centimeters thick, like five, six inches thick. Uh, and then the stuff below also has a lot greater sand content, less silt and clay, less mud. So it definitely seems like we're moving proximal in a system. And I'll bet as we continue landward, it's going to get even sandier, which again is giving us an important clue because if this was a sand body that's kind of getting pushed along uh, by longshore currents, you might not necessarily expect it to have unidirectional flow offshore and maybe not as uh, dramatically rapid a thickness change as you go landward, unless it thins again towards the other side. Let's keep walking and let's keep looking. Well, I made it safe and sound to that part of the cliff that's pretty well exposed. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna bring the students here. Universities are kind of funny about not wanting to lose students. There's no way oil company geologists would be allowed on an outcrop like this. Um, when I worked for a company, my boss and the safety people would have had a heart attack if I showed them a photograph of this and said, hey, I want to go climb around and look at rocks. Um, probably the smart thing to do because, yeah, it's a, it's a drop down there. Fortunately, I don't work at an oil company or a university full time now, so you know, I can get away with all kinds of crazy stuff in the interest of science. So what I noticed about this outcrop here, and this might be the only way students and oil company people will see this outcrop because they're sure as shooting not gonna come up here. But it's pretty cool in that there's a coursing and cleaning upward cycle, then a second cycle, and then a final cycle up at the top. So there's three of them. Um, you might be tempted to say parasequences of some kind. In other words, progradations of a shoreline or a delta. There's something to that because in the cycle that's right in front of us, the sands are just like we saw the first outcrop, parallel planar bedded at the base and then ripple laminated up at the top. And the ripples are really, really clean ripples. I mean, you can, you can tell they're smiling out at you because the way they're cut. Um, so planar lamination and ripples, planar and ripples, planar and ripples, that's typical of turbidity flows. You might have heard of a Bauma sequence named for Arnold Bauma, who was a professor at LSU and recognized that turbidity currents leave very distinct packages of sediment. A typical 100% perfect Bauma sequence, and you almost never find them, would start off with a scour base, and then it would be kind of massive sand, then go into the planar laminated sand, then the ripple laminated sand, and then a mud cap at the top, right? That kind of sounds familiar. 
uh, and people break them out into T, A, B, C, D. Uh, that just means turbidite A, B, C, D. It's kind of frustrating because uh, that's an interpretation, uh, but I've been in the core lab and on the outcrop um, and looking at image logs with people that insist on calling every ripple mark uh, you know, a TB or every planar laminated bed a, a TC or something like that. Like, uh, okay, let's take a step back from that and just describe the facies, the sedimentary structures as they are. In this case, though, I'm going to take that bold step and say because I'm seeing repeated cycles of that, of planar laminated to ripples, planar to ripples, planar to ripples, I'm going to say that, you know what, maybe, maybe we really are seeing um, incomplete turbidite successions. It's not unheard of here in the book cliffs, and in fact, in the panther tongue delta, which is the most studied delta probably in the entire universe, uh, and I say that confidently because I'm including Martian deltas and everything, um, but the delta forsets are made up predominantly of turbidites. So we know turbidity currents and deltas are pretty common here in the western interior. I think these probably are turbidity currents, and they're turbidites that were produced by turbidity currents, and there's a couple of cycles uh, possibly related to whatever's going on in the hinterland there uh, on shore. That could be a whole range of things, everything from climate to the delta lobe switching to um, uh, sediment sourcing. You know, that's a game for later when we're sitting around in the bar and drawing on napkins and whatnot. But for now, let's keep seeing what we see because I think there's a pretty good case to be made that these are turbidites um, flowing into the basin into an otherwise oxygen-deprived basin, as indicated by our friend Chondrites and some other stuff. Let's keep looking. You never know what else you're gonna find as you walk along, walk along the outcrop. Just a second here to talk about depositional processes. Uh, man, when this sand was done depositing, it was done. Because take a look behind me between the sand that I'm standing on and the hill in the distance, there's nothing but mud. There's a few boulders and maybe a couple of ledges out there that might be in place sand or silt. But by and large, when we got done with whatever this little series of sand bodies prograding into the basin represents, once that was done, man, we were back to quiet water, well, relatively quiet waters of the Mancos Shale you know, relatively deep water, uh, a couple hundred meters deep maybe, maybe tens of meters. That's up for debate. But the point is, it went from being lots of sand injected into the basin to basically no sand injected into the basin until the classic book cliffs forming sandstones of the Mesa Verde and Blackhawk started coming in. I mean, it's just, it's like a tabletop all around me once you get to the top of the sand. So it switched off. Whatever was happening, it absolutely switched off. And then the Mancos took over. That's pretty cool. I don't care who you are, that's pretty interesting. All right, so we've kind of reached the end of this first cliff. And you can kind of see behind me here, those ridges continue on. But what's interesting is that a couple of the lower ones actually pinch out. They seem to vanish into the distance. So we're not carrying the entire ridge forming succession out there into um, the western part of the outcrop belt. So we've got lensoidal shaped and cross-section bodies. Um, they're thicker in the middle, they kind of thin again at both ends, not like a channel because we're not seeing scouring and incision. They seem to be kind of anti-formal um, or anti-clinal shaped uh, bodies. Lensoidal, like I say, if you want to call them lozen shaped. That's fine. So I think the interpretation that I and many, many other people have come up with over the years is pretty consistent in that we've got the turbidity currents. We've got very fine grained sand coming out into the basin, an otherwise anoxic, or I should say a low oxygen content basin as indicated by the chondrites. Lobe shaped bodies, that sounds an awful lot like fans. Um, Back in the day, they used to call them low stand fans, turbidite fans. Um, there's a couple of new models coming out of deltas, and deltas for a long time have been interpreted as having a very simple slope. Uh, Ron Steele and some others in the, the UT Austin group have come up with some new models based on modern deltas, where there's a subaqueous delta platform. So deltas actually have two 
um, main components to them once you get below sea level. Uh, and that subaqueous delta platform um, has a lot of processes that used to be considered exclusive to deep water or slope systems. My personal feeling on this um, shouldn't matter because feelings don't enter into it. My deduction based on scientific observation is that this material in the hatch mesa or whatever you want to call it is consistent with uh, subaqueous turbidite fed delta lobe that's probably got a main deltaic body somewhere to the west. Um, it might be the Aberdeen member, it might be any of the other um, sandstone members out there. I think this has been correlated most recently to the Aberdeen. Um, so you've got the coastal plain fluvial deltaic succession of the Aberdeen, that's just to the west. Feed out, you've got the shallow delta platform, then you've got the secondary deeper delta platform. That's where during massive, massive sediment dispersal events and storms onshore, this sand could have bypassed the first stage of the delta, continued on subaqueously, set up a turbidite system, and fed out onto the lower delta platform, the secondary um, delta front, if you will. So that's my going hypothesis at the moment. Um, I'm going to think this over for the next couple of days before I get the students and the geologists out here. Uh, read some papers, take a look and see what the current thinking is on this. But I think we've at least got a good story based on observations to tell to the students and the geos. Uh, we'll see what they think. They're probably going to see stuff I haven't seen or haven't noticed, and that's always interesting. So I'm looking forward to that. And thanks for joining along on this little adventure to revisit an outcrop I haven't been to in many, many years. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you again on the outcrop. Thanks for watching.